Hey there everyone, this is Carl with Trial Byte Studios, and today I'd like to answer a certain question that has bothered me for a long time. Now, as someone with a degree in biology, and as someone who has an interest in both geology and paleontology, I understand that the Earth has gone through several mass extinctions, and that, presumably, another is bound to happen. All life as we know it today is a result of a cycle of mass die-offs and repopulation, or speciation as biologists like to say. So this cycle leaves me wondering. Could we humans, as a species, survive the exact same type of cataclysmic event that wiped out the dinosaurs? This event is known as the KT extinction to scientists, and saw the extinction of 85% of all life on Earth. All terrestrial animals weighing more than 55 pounds or 25 kilos were wiped out, and the seas became a concoction of death. Obviously, humans tend to weigh a lot more than 55 pounds. So again, I ask the question, could we survive? Now before we can determine if humans could survive the KT extinction, we have to first understand what the KT extinction was, how it happened, and what made it deadly. So what do we know about the KT? Well, sometime around 65 million years ago, a massive asteroid estimated to be more than 6 miles across, or roughly the size of Mount Everest, slammed into the Earth in what is today the modern Yucatan Peninsula and the Gulf of Mexico. The impact of this asteroid is now estimated to be as powerful as 10 billion of the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki during the Second World War, and the impact created a crater in the Earth around 180 kilometers or 110 miles wide, and can still be seen today. The impact also sent huge clouds of ash and other massive pieces of rubble into the atmosphere, clouding the skies around the world. The evidence for this huge sun-blocking cloud is a geologic anomaly known as the KT Boundary. The KT Boundary is a layer of sediment found around the world on various continents, and is presumably a layer of sediment laid down when the dust from the impact settled. The KT Boundary sediments from various countries can all be dated to around 65 million years ago, so we know that something had to have happened during this time in order to create this geologic anomaly. Now on to the fun part. Let's talk about how devastating the KT truly was. In order to do this, let me set a scene. It's the modern day and you're on vacation at the Gulf of Mexico. You're having a great time enjoying the sun, the sand, and the surf. Eventually the day drags on into the evening and you're just about to leave. You take one last look to admire the beautiful sunset before you, when suddenly you notice it. A strange bright object, a little higher in the sky. You think it must just be an airplane reflecting the sunlight. You finish gathering the rest of your belongings and take a glance back up to see if you can catch another glimpse of that strange object. To your shock, it's gotten bigger and brighter. A lot brighter. You stare at it for a few seconds, wondering just what it is. Now a low hum starts to drone in your ears. Oh, it is just an airplane, you think to yourself as you turn to leave the beach. You take a few steps forward and your skin begins to burn. Blisters start to form on the back of your arms from the intense heat, and the hum turns into a deafening roar as the heat becomes unbearable. All around you, people begin screaming and running. You take a quick glance back and see it, an unfathomably large asteroid, ten times brighter and hotter than the sun, bearing down on the Earth. Just glancing at it burns your retinas and nearly blinds you. With a terrified shout, you make a mad dash for your car, your blood and skin now literally boiling off of you, dripping off of you from the intense heat. The last sound you hear is your own blood escaping from your body in hot puffs of steam before your eardrums rupture from the roar of the meteor. Then a blinding flash, and then nothing. In less than two minutes, the world as we know it is gone. Alright, so now that we've gone through that fun hypothetical scene at Ground Zero, let's dive deeper into the effects of the KT on modern humans. The scene we just went through, while terrifying, is true. Those unlucky enough to be looking at the asteroid as it hurtled toward Earth would have been completely blinded, and everything within the asteroid's immediate impact zone would have been vaporized almost instantly. The heat created from the asteroid hurtling through the Earth's atmosphere would be hot enough to cause third-degree burns and melt skin. After the impact, it doesn't get much better. The heat created from the impact would ignite the very air around the asteroid, and combined with the shock wave would create an outward-expanding fireball, moving at the speed of sound, raising everything in its path. The rest of the world isn't safe from the immediate effects either. During the KT, it is estimated that even on the other side of the planet, static air temperatures reached 150 degrees Celsius or about 300 degrees Fahrenheit for a matter of seconds. That means spontaneous combustion for untreated wood, dry forests, and grasslands, second degree burns to exposed skin, and anyone unlucky enough to be outside while wearing cheap synthetic fibers like polyethylene, which ignites at 135 degrees Celsius, and HMPE, would find those fibers melting into their skin. Forest fires would rage across the entire world, damaging ecosystems, destroying land, and potentially taking lives. Oh, and remember when I mentioned that the impact sent massive chunks of rubble and debris flying up into the atmosphere? Well, what goes up must come down. The entirety of the United States and the lower parts of Canada would be pelted by flaming pieces of Earth and asteroid, anywhere from the size of golf balls to the size of small buildings immediately following impact. So, don't get hit. But there is a ray of hope. 
If you somehow manage to survive all the initial destruction, there is a high possibility that humans could survive fairly normally in the aftermath of the KT. Scientists have long hypothesized that it was not the sheer destructive force of the KT that brought about the dinosaur's downfall, rather it was what occurred in the months and years following the impact. I already mentioned that the impact sent a huge cloud of dust in the atmosphere. What I have not yet mentioned is that it is estimated to have taken more than a year for that dust and suit to settle back to the Earth's surface. This means that almost no light from the sun could reach the Earth's surface for that time. It created what scientists refer to as an impact winter. This means very little to no plant growth occurred for more than a year and global temperatures plummeted. This is what scientists hypothesize ultimately led to the extinction of the dinosaurs. To sum it up simply, if plants could not grow and reproduce, then herbivores had nothing to feed on. If the herbivores could not eat and reproduce, then they died. If the herbivores died, then the carnivores soon followed. It's as basic as third grade science. If one link in the chain breaks, the whole chain fails. This is why only terrestrial animals weighing under 55 pounds, or 25 kilos, were able to survive the KT extinction. Put simply, smaller animals eat less and therefore can survive on less. So that brings us back to humans. How would we weather the impact following the KT extinction? Keep in mind, this is a global winter, so there's no importing grains, fruits, or vegetables from other warmer parts of the world. In the months following the impact, grasses, crops, and trees would all begin to fail, which is really bad news for humans. We rely on grasses, grains, and various other crops not simply for our own meals, but to feed the billions of livestock animals around the world that we consume on a daily basis. That steak you're eating has to come from somewhere. However, in contrast to the dinosaurs of the Cretaceous, humans have developed technologies that aid us in survival. Therefore, it is my opinion that as long as humans still have access to the resources to generate electricity, like natural gases, coal, wind, and nuclear power, we don't need the sun, a la that one episode of The Simpsons where Mr. Burns tries to block out the sun. With modern electricity, we have created technology that allows us to control our environment. Lights to turn night into day, heaters to turn winter into summer. Modern man is not just adaptable, we've mastered our environment. Let's set up another hypothetical scenario. It's one week after impact, and everything seems normal. Granted, it is really cold outside, and some of your neighbors might have been crushed by rubble. The selection at the grocery store is terrible, and you're out of toilet paper. But other than that, everything's pretty normal. You're watching the news on television, and the reporter is talking about the events that have occurred in the following days after impact. Governments around the world have lost members, but are functioning as well as they can. Most governments have seized control of all private industry, including agriculture, and have begun regulating store prices and quantity to ensure that everyone has access to the resources that are left. They have mandated that all crops which are in season be picked and stored for the time being to preserve them, and that all seeds be turned over to the government. The reporter then announces that your government is going to initiate a program to begin building and converting old buildings into massive grow houses. Huge mile-long buildings made entirely of steel and concrete where they will use LED lighting to begin cultivating new crops and where they will breed and house livestock. Each major city will have multiple grow houses and thousands more will be located all around the country. The reporter also announces that access to oil and gas will be limited for civilians and regulated. With that, the reporter signs off. Now this is how I imagine a post-KT modern world could still survive. Like I said before, with modern electricity, humans are the masters of their environments. We don't need the sun to warm and light plants, we can just do it ourselves. Granted, this is a scenario in which humans still have access to all the raw materials needed for construction and power, minus wood. But in reality, that's likely what would happen. We have access all around the world to thousands of sites to harvest raw material like coal, iron, and oil. And as long as we extract more of the material than we use to extract it, we can continue to function as a modern society. Now, what if we lost access to those raw material sites? Would humans still be able to survive? In short, I still think yes, but not as the modern technology-driven society that we know today. With that said, let me introduce you to these guys called Preppers. Across the country, ordinary Americans from all walks of life are taking whatever measures necessary to prepare. I'm preparing my family for the total destruction of the power grid. The Yellowstone supervolcano. A financial collapse. And protect themselves. When survival's the goal, it's into the spider hole. Go fast, 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 fast. Go, 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 go. From what they perceive is the fast approaching end of the world as we know it. Now these guys have spent their entire lives prepping for the apocalypse, hence the name Preppers. Most preppers keep enough resources in their bunkers to survive for years after doomsday. Thanks to these guys, even if everyone else on the earth is wiped out, humans will continue to live on at least for a few more years. Or maybe a few more generations, depending on how these guys feel about inbreeding. Now of course we could sit here all day and talk about what would happen if society were really hit by the KT and would humans really survive, 
Uh, and it raises a lot of questions like, would wars break out over raw materials? Would governments actually seize all the resources? Would society simply fall apart into a Mad Max style free-for-all? Would animals be driven into human civilization in a desperate gamble to find food? Well, I'm not here to answer that. I was here to answer my question that I posed. So I'll let you all argue about that in the comments down below. On your way out, go ahead and like the video, subscribe while you're at it. This has been Carl with Trial Bite Studios. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.